and when you do the work that I just did with Lion, this is the type of dog that you get that can travel with you in the car. I have zero leashes on him right now. Um, but you'll see, even while I run into the store, watch how he is. Now this is how a dog that's used to traveling travels. I never put the window down further than his snout can get out. The reason why you never want your window all the way down is because flying objects in the street, a car not paying attention, getting too close, clipping the dog's head, you don't want to put your dog in danger, okay? Um, I would have normally actually had a seatbelt on him, but I was running out the house, uh, switching dogs real quick to go run to the store and pick something up. But I wanted to show you what it is to travel with a dog that is very used to the car, very secure in the car, doesn't bark at people um, or things when you're dealing with a mature dog and when you're dealing with a puppy, when you're able to see the two differences with the work that I did with um, Lion uh, gives you the product that I have with Apollo. It's never an easy um, situation. Everybody sees Apollo and thinks, well, I want a dog like him, but nobody has any clue on what it took in the amount of training that it took to get the dog that I have in Apollo. I'm very thankful for him, uh, but it did take a lot of work to get Apollo. You know, a dog that I can travel with, a dog that doesn't mind the car, a dog that I can leave the house with no leash or anything with. Um, he has no harness, no collar, no leash with. I know I'm just running to a store. Um, I would normally have that in the car and with me just in case you never know what situation might come up. But my hungry brain was working more so than my preparing for anything type brain was working so my hungry brain kind of won in this situation um but i'm here at the location to pick up some food and um, i'm just going to show you what it's like to have a dog that you can um, leave in the car without a situation. Oh, that's a one way. Sorry. I'm going to go back around real quick because I just want to park at a closer spot. Um, all right. So. I'm leaving him in the car. I am leaving windows down. It is not hot. It is raining here in Florida. Um, but I want to you guys to see. I'm actually gonna leave my phone in the car too. And you get to see how Apollo is. He might get in the front seat. Sometimes he does that. I don't mind because uh, he gets right into the back seat when I tell him to. So I don't really care if he jumps in the front seat. He doesn't have a driver's license, so he's not going anywhere. So I'll be back.
I guess he stayed in the back, huh? Okay, so. One day, Lion will be able to get to that point where you can leave him in the car and he won't bark, he won't cry, he won't have separation anxieties, um, and be able to ride with him anywhere. That's one of the great things of putting in the work of training. So we'll see how he is on our way home. And if it's not a good video because of movement or sounds, I'll just cut it. It really doesn't matter, right? One reason why you do always want to put your dog in a seat belt, um, which again, I'm a horrible example right now, so please forgive me. Um, hungry brain over just preparing uh, my dog for the best situation. Sometimes my brain does not work. Um, so. The reason why you always want your dog to have a seatbelt on is this opening in between the seats. If I was to slam on my brake for any reason at all, my dog will go flying through the middle um, of the car and can really hurt himself can break his neck, can break his legs. Um, it would be the same as a child without being in a car seat. Now I come from the era that we didn't have car seats like they have today. And what was our car seat was your parents arm going across your chest to hold you in the position. Um, but now they do have mechanisms that you can be a lot safer. When I had a truck, it was actually a lot safer for me to travel with my dog in a crate. And my mentor taught me this um, with one of the dog shows that we went to. Was she put a picture of her dogs on her crate with their name with an emergency number. Now, what I started doing was a little bit extra, right? Was I would uh, definitely, I'm gonna close the window so you can possibly hear me better. Um, I went a little bit extra with that. Not only would I travel with him in a crate and put his picture on it, put his name and put emergency contacts, but I also put what his cue was for him to always return back, okay? Because my cue was not the average cue of just calling his name. My dog will not come to you if you call him by his name outside. Um, you have to know a specific whistle to be able to get his recall. Um, some of my other dogs that I traveled with when I had pit bulls, all their cues were in different languages. So God forbid something would have happened and my dogs got out their crate during traveling time and was frightened and running away, the average person is going to like call for them, do any type of whistle, um, but they wouldn't know the cue to get them to come back, right? So you should always have a very strong recall cue 
that you might not always use and it only be used in an emergency situation keep that one really really strong and then when you're traveling with your dog um, you have that specific cue attached to their picture and emergency contact information um, this way you know that anybody would be able to get your dog back um, if you do a cue that is not very strong and the dog doesn't always return when you have when you say that cue that's not the cue that you want to provide on that paperwork um, the reason why I use different languages um, with specific cues is so that they could always stay very strong. A person, an average person, um, my nieces, uh, my mother, my sister, my brothers, uh, visitors, um, they can't water down that cue by using it and not reinforcing it, right? When you're home and you have family and stuff like that that comes around your dogs, a lot of the cues get watered down and the reason why they get watered down is because your family member will use it and not pay for it. Um, so those cues get watered down very quickly and very easily. So you always want um, a cue that stays really strong and it won't get watered down and not everybody necessarily knows it, but it's used in emergency situations. So um, my dog will always know that I am speaking to him, okay? So those are just little things that me as a trainer does. I don't know if the average person thinks of things like that, but um, I make sure that outside I use a lot of whistles um, and a lot of different whistles to mean different things, right? And I don't always share the information with people. So, which is why I don't leave my dogs with people. Um, my dog will be left with my mother and that's kind of really it. Um, because I can trust her with all his cues to um, never one water them down. She knows to keep them as emergency cues. And, um, you know, you always set your dog up to succeed um, by keeping those cues very reinforced and very high value. Uh, so some of my dogs were all hand signals, some of them were all whistles, some of them different languages. So I use different things for each one of my dogs. Um, each dog also has a different cue when I'm working with multiple dogs or when I have personal multiple dogs each dog has a different cue so they know who I'm talking to when they're all out in a group if I need to just get one back in um, or something like that so as a dog owner those might be things when you're looking for a dog trainer um, or even working with your own dog if you know how to work with your own dog in a positive reinforcement manner um, those are things you might want to take into consideration uh, that each dog knows which one you're speaking with and things like that. So I'm going to show you how um, we're about to get out the car and how he is still going to listen without his leash, collar, or anything on. This is how you know when you're using positive reinforcement because if I had a prong collar or an e-collar on him and ran out the house without it, he might not listen to me, right? Because he's waiting for that collar to be on or they reinforce the cues only with something on them. I work with my dog in every situation. Collars on, no collars on, harnesses on, harnesses off. Uh, dragging a leash around, zero leashes, off property, on property. I want him to know that I'm working with him at every situation. All day, every day is a training session with him. Um, and that's how I have a very well-behaved dog. You never know when I have to trump a situation that's coming up um, where what he used to never react to, he now all of a sudden reacts to. I'm always prepared for those situations. So, um, 
I'm gonna let you see how we work. Now I'll tell you right now, a dog or a cat could come out of nowhere, right? And I wouldn't know if I didn't practice if my dog would come with me. Right now he's just sniffing, we're on our property so he can sniff all he wants. Um, he's looking for a place to pee because I just had Lion, another dog out here um, who probably peed in that spot over there. So, let's go. <whistles> now that's not his cue in an emergency situation. That's just his cue to follow. So, and he comes right home. So you want to practice with your dog in all situations and in any scenario. Um, and it will always have you as the higher value and your dog always wanting to work with you. Um, that I'm not really concerned about anything around me because I know I have my dog. So hope that was helpful for everybody.